For the next couple of videos, we're going to be looking at how do you tell stories with data. We've been talking about data visualization tools, descriptive statistics, inferential statistics. Why do all of this? So that you can convey a message and you're trying to win hearts and minds to make an argument to convince people of certain things. So the way to do that is to make your data tell a story. It's really important that our data tell a story. We can use storytelling to share a vision. What do we see for the organization where we should be going? We can show, share our organizational values. We can inspire action, teach a lesson, or build trust. So some of the graphs and visuals that we've been making in videos, we know we might want to convey that there are union concerns. So we're sharing our vision of the organization where our members are valued, appreciated, and want to stay. We're trying to inspire action. We're trying to get change within the organization. And we're trying to convey to our members that we are fighting for what they value the most. So with a single word cloud, right, we're trying to build trust, inspire action, share a vision. And so we might create a word cloud like this that says, you know, our workers want flexibility. You know, they're focused on opportunities and hours and childcare. We might want to convey that our customers fall into certain groups. And so we'll do some videos about cluster analysis, trying to identify certain cohorts to focus on. So we're trying to train our employees that we are focusing on different types of customers and they have different needs. So kind of teaching a lesson here um, and trying to inspire action in terms of focusing on these different groups. So we might create a graph like you see here that identifies there are different types of customers based on the amount they spend on the length of membership they have with our organization. Maybe we're trying to make some decisions here we're trying to show uh, some of the risks for our organization, trying to help make decisions. Uh, so we want to make sure that those decisions share our organizational values. And so how much risk taking are we willing to take? What are we considering? And of course, we want to inspire action. And so we might do a simulation like what you see kind of behind my head, uh, which is where we look at um, different changing conditions, changing assumptions. And in this case, this is the probability of loan compliance. Everything to the right of this graph is the times and scenarios where we are in compliance. Everything to the left of that dark line, we are not. And so we can see here that we would be in compliance 83% of the time based on our simulation and scenarios. So we use storytelling to share a vision, share our values, inspire action, teach a lesson, build trust. And storytelling with data does make a difference. There's a Journal of Experimental Psychology found that when the same case about a Boston bar fight was presented to some different groups as a research project, what they found is that how the data was presented changed the ruling. So when the case was presented with just straight data, here's some straight facts, 63% of the participants in the study found the individual guilty. When the defense framed the data in the form of a story, only 31% of the participants found the individual guilty. They sided with the defense, or the majority, 70%, sided with the defense. When the prosecution framed the data in the form of a story, then 78% found the individual guilty. So siding with the prosecution. So storytelling with data makes a difference. Just telling facts straight out doesn't necessarily win you hearts and minds. So we want to make sure that the way we convey our information is attached to a story. In fact, what we find is that when information is presented as just straight facts, people are more likely to critique the facts they don't like. Uh, we've talked before about cognitive bias, and cognitive bias means that we are more likely to accept unquestionably the information that already attaches to what we know and what we value. So when you tell us things that don't match what we observe, what we feel, what we want to believe, then we're more likely to push back. This becomes harder if it is told as a story. So that's because the human brain assesses information differently uh, depending on if it's more of a narrative or whether it's more analytical. And we know that if it 
the information agrees with existing knowledge and emotions, we're more likely to be attached to them. And if it disagrees, we're more likely to see it as a threat. So by providing a narrative context, we create empathy, we attach emotion to it, and then it's more likely to be accepted because it attaches to emotions we already have. Uh, if we give context, it ties to existing information. When facts are presented as visualizations, it's much harder for our brain to reject them outright. So think about this one. How contentious is COVID? Uh, and depending on where you are, uh, if we just set out straight, here's the fact. Coronavirus deaths worldwide have been 705 million people. Just the straight fact, right? We're going to see people who don't like that, who that goes against what, uh, what they feel, what they know, it doesn't fit with them and, and their perspective, are going to say, oh, well, well, but that's that's not just COVID. Those people might have died of something else. Those are just people who are already sickly or obese, right? So there's a lot of pushback if you just provide the straight fact in terms of COVID. So how can we turn this into a narrative, into a story that provides more of an emotional connection that ties better with our existing knowledge and, and emotions um, and that can be presented visually? So this is a visualization from Visual Capitalist. They make fantastic visuals. Uh, and so I encourage you to go to their website or subscribe to them uh, and get all kinds of visuals. So what are they doing here with this particular visualization? What they're trying to do is put into context the history of pandemics. So we have some people who are saying COVID is no big deal. Some people saying that COVID is catastrophic. So let's put it into context. And so what we see here is that this, this actual, this visualization came early in COVID. Uh, so the dot of the time was much smaller as opposed to the 705 million that you see here. Uh, this, if you look at this, the 705 million, uh, this is bigger than the circle that they have illustrated as a potential amount. So it's actually a bit bigger. So it's closer here if we're looking at it. Of course, this is all super small, right? So we talk about 700 million deaths. That's greater than the Great Plague. That's greater than smallpox. That is uh, more than three times the size of the bubonic plague, if we're going back in time. Um, yellow fever was 100,000 in comparison. Spanish flu was 50 million. We're talking about 700 million. So in terms of, so if you look at history, for example, the Spanish flu in 1918, at that time, there they shut down uh, events and people stayed home. The images from the Spanish flu show just um, makeshift camps, uh, hospitals, and just beds of people. And in fact, there's discussion about how the Spanish flu and the fact that everyone was kind of locked up, couldn't go anywhere, put aside their money. And because of that, they then, um, you know, when Spanish flu was finally done, you were just so happy to be alive and haven't made it. And you had suffered because if you weren't sick or knew someone was sick, you were kind of stuck and couldn't do anything and go anywhere. You were so excited to be alive that you spent money and that became the roaring 20s. So as we start to look at this history of the pandemics and putting COVID into perspective, you know, we realize that the Spanish flu was 50 million deaths. And we look at COVID in terms of um, 705 million deaths, right? In terms of proportion, yes, population is bigger, uh, but we can refer back to what the time was like then and the impact that it had versus the impact uh, here. So if we look at the 705 million deaths worldwide from COVID, right, that is more than all of these different pandemics that they're showing here. And so looking at then how COVID really was a big deal, um, we put it into context and we start to share the story that is history. Then it becomes a little bit harder to push back uh, on that particular fact of the 705 million deaths and the impact that COVID had. So we need to tell, <laughs> we need to tell stories with our data. When you tell stories with data, we need to think about a couple things. Who is the audience that we're trying to tell this story to? 
what level are they at uh, in terms of their knowledge of uh, the data? Are they for or against it? Are they literate in terms of graphs and um, the visuals, the statistical approaches we're using, right? If we're going to show them visuals and try to convey to them information, do they understand what this type of graph looks like? Are we at the level and approaching it in a method that is acceptable to our audience? What questions do they need answered? So you need to anticipate what it is they want to know as well as what they're gonna do with this information. In other words, why should they care? So if we look at the right here, this visualization, this is created by Google during COVID. And this is the reports about mobility. So they're looking at Google Maps to see how much people are moving around during COVID. And so what we see here is that for Edmonton, Alberta, you can see that uh, the baseline, that's the this middle line right here, that's the before COVID average. And what you see, for example, is there's a lot less people on public transportation and there's a lot less people working in an office, right? People were working from home. What we do see is that there are spikes in parks. So more people were getting out during COVID outside to enjoy things because they couldn't go to other locations. And so we can see their movement here. If this is our visualization, we're asking ourselves, well, who is the audience? The audience for this particular graph might be municipal government or provincial government or federal government trying to decide what are the requirements for what can be open and not and uh, how well are people abiding by rules that we've made in terms of what can be open and where people can go and are they socially distancing? And what are they gonna do with this information? Well, if we're looking at compliance, we might recognize that we need to crack down a bit if we're seeing a lot of people at retail and recreation when those businesses are not supposed to be open or they're supposed to be socially distancing. So who is the audience? What questions they need answered? and what will they go about doing with the information? We tend to err on the, oh, this is nice to know, here's some interesting things. But at the end of the day, we need to make charts and graphs and do statistical analysis that can be utilized, which comes back to this storytelling here. What are you trying to do? Share a vision, share values, inspire action, teach a lesson, build trust. What information are you trying to convey? And does the visual that you have chosen actually help you to accomplish that? So what are you trying to accomplish? And what are the highlights? Do your visualizations, does the statistical analysis methods you choose, do they actually hit those highlights? And then the other question we want to address here is, are you trying to win hearts or minds? Here's why that matters. Oh, we'll come back to that other one because obviously I forgot a slide. So who are you trying to win hearts? Or are you trying to win minds? So this matters because the approach you take to storytelling is going to be different depending on if you are focused on changing their heart. So you want them to feel or whether you are trying to change the way they're thinking uh, in terms of changing their minds. So if you are trying to win hearts, then you're trying to make it personal, use analogies, stories that are emotionally triggering um, in your arguments. And so we want, if we're creating visualizations, if we're showing data, we want data that actually makes you feel, okay? Now, when do you do that? You do that if you're introducing a new idea, something novel, okay? We want that emotional attachment to this idea. If we're trying to get people to buy in, on some shared values or direction of the organization and it's new, we want to win their hearts. We wanna get them uh, emotionally attached. So if your audience is in an emotional state, then you wanna focus on winning their hearts because they're already in that emotional state. Now, if your audience is struggling, so they all have lots of different opinions, then you do want to focus on more of that emotional connection because that will unite them even if they're coming from very different perspectives. If your ideas are disruptive to the norm, so you're making radical changes, either it's a new idea or it's quite different from what we've done before, 
Then we want to tell stories with data that attach an emotion to it. And if you've already made a decision and your focus here is to gain support for that decision, again, we're focusing on more analogies, more personal impact, and more emotional ties in our presentation of our data and information. In comparison, if we are conveying information that's quite complex, then we want to focus more on winning the mind. So we want to create visualizations and stories that take a big complex item and break them down into its pieces by asking questions, diving deeper, um, and focusing then more on how people think and process information, laying it out. If our ideas are not disruptive to the norm, so we're adding something, but it is consistent with the values or the things we've been doing, then we can focus on that rational decision of should we go for it? And so that would be, for example, like here, if we're looking at probability of loan compliance and we're trying to decide whether or not we should get some additional loans, it's already for things that we're already doing, so it's not counter to our current objectives. It's an alignment with our organizational values. And so we're really just trying to help them in that cost benefit analysis, make the decision by providing those details to what might be a more complex decision. So here then we are more about uh, pros and cons, right? Showing them with our data, with our story, the, the benefits or downsides to a particular decision. If we are trying to change direction, uh, then we can also try, we can also use the approach of winning minds. And here again, back to the pros and cons. So with your story, are you trying to show the benefits, the downsides and how the benefits outweigh those downsides? Or are you trying to trigger an emotion, a personal connection uh, with what you're trying to convey? So we need to think about those things as we're telling our story with our data. And ultimately, we need to understand who our audience is. What are their priorities? What are their beliefs, their values? What is most important to them? If you are using your data to make an argument at work, uh, what are the key performance indicators for the business in terms of how do we measure success? Uh, how do we define success as the organization? Tying it to the priorities, beliefs, preferences, the expectations of the audience. You need to recognize that there is an appropriate timing of information. So for example, we send out surveys, send out surveys on at Tuesday at 9.30, because if we ask for information on Fridays, no one looks at it, it gets lost in the email over the weekend. If you do it too early on Monday, it's all lost in the giant list of emails you're trying to catch up with over the weekend. Uh, and so there is a perfect time to both solicit information from people, but also to give them information. When is it, when are they the most receptive? Perhaps you've been in a meeting at four or five o'clock on a Friday. Uh, if it is something that is boring and just someone droning on, it's not the appropriate timing. So if you're talking about making key decisions, then it needs to be at a time that is appropriate. And so we need to understand as we are presenting information, whether we are trying to win the hearts or minds, introduce new ideas, change direction, there is opportune times for these type of, of information to be better received. And so we have to understand our audience well enough to understand when that is. If there is a highly emotional time, um, maybe someone there's been... Um, a situation at work that's been a bit disruptive, maybe someone has lost a family member. So everyone who's been kind of emotionally engaged in an issue either related to the business or someone related to the business. If they're in that highly emotional state and you need them to understand a complex issue, trying to win minds when they're in that emotional state is not gonna work. So you really do have to understand when people are most receptive to the information and the type of information you're conveying. We talked about level of familiarity with the topic, data literacy. We also need to understand the mix of the audience. Are they all very similar in their views and opinions? 
Are they all very similar in their knowledge of the topic? Are they all very similar in their knowledge of statistics, data visualizations, and so on? The more varied the audience, the more the different priorities, expectations, uh, the more you have to consider that when you put your story together that's going to appeal to and be accessible for all of them.